Good morning, Grace Church. Hey, grab a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 12. Let's get into it. <clears throat> we are in Holy Week. Lots of conflict. Lots of conflict in the temple. I'm just kind of glad that I don't go to church and have conflict, you know? Like, came to church to worship and all I got was people arguing with me, you know? Um, it's it's Jesus' life here, at, towards the end of his life, is going to the temple and getting into conflict, disputes. Um, people approaching him with questions, trying to trip him up. Here's Mark 12, 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, you are right, teacher. You've truly said that he is one and there is no one besides him. And to love one with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we look at your word today, as we look at the greatest commandment, as we consider our obligation to you, I pray, Lord, that you would, in the middle of this sermon, would you, would you just point out places, things, actions, thoughts that you want us to have, actions you want us to take as a result of considering how to love you. I know it, will look, it might look a little different for each person as they hear this today, so I pray that you would speak in your word and in these words of explanation to each of our hearts. We thank you for this t time. We set it aside. We ask that you'd use it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, certainly, if you're like me, one of the things that, that has probably happened to most of us is sticker shock. Has it ever happened to you in a restaurant where you've eaten a meal and, and you get your bill for it, and you're like, how could it be that high? What did we eat that was that expensive? Oh, yes, we're a family of six. That does happen sometimes. Occasionally, you'll get your bill, and you'll look at it, and you're like, I, I don't think the spaghetti was supposed to be that much, you know? I think that's different. Maybe you've had a moment in your life where you've actually talked to the waiter or the waitress and you're like, I think you got it wrong. This can't possibly be right. Is this what I owe you? <laughs> you know, um, maybe you're just a high roller and you just pay the bill and say, no, that's not that's how I roll, you know. I, I don't know. But, but when it comes to God, we owe him something. There, 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 there is something to be said for what we are, due, what we are paying due to God. Now that, salvation's free, it's a gift of faith, right? I mean, it's, it's, it just comes by faith. But, but Jesus said, and we looked at this last week, render to Caesar, pay Caesar what's Caesar's. And pay God, render to God what's God's. It's not that we, 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 we pay him to earn something from him, because that's not how faith works. But we are obligated to God and Jesus is talking about that obligation. If you wondered, like, what are we supposed to render to Caesar? Last week we answered that question by saying, just like Caesar's image was on the coin, so God's image is stamped onto us. And so we give ourselves back to God. Now you want to know, what does that look like? What does that mean very specifically? And that is all about what we're talking about today. So um, this is a three-part sermon. And uh, part one is... Uh, the great commandment is love. So you've got a scribe, and I've got to tell you who these scribes are. There's all these people that have been opposing Jesus, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. They love Herod. And now you've got a scribe. Scribes are like the experts in the law. They're the people that you go to to talk about, you know, what does this law mean? How do I apply this to my life? They know. they got the details. They're also copiers of the law. So they would copy the law down with great care to make sure every word was accurate. They were counters of letters. They knew like 
what the middle letter was in the book of Jeremiah. So they could count, 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 and they come to the middle letter, and boom, it's the letter whatever, you know, and they would know what it is. And if they got it wrong, you got to toss out the, the, the manuscript because it's incorrect. They're counters, copiers, experts. And so an expert in the law asked Jesus an expert question. Now we'll compare in a moment here that he's actually asking God an expert question about the law, God's law. So he came to the right person, even though he feels like he is probably the authority here. He finds that Jesus is actually the authority. And so his question is, what is the greatest commandment? Now, knowing that there are over 600 Old Testament commandments, he's not suggesting that you get to ignore some commandments that you don't care about. Like, I don't really worry about this, so I'm just going to push it aside. He's a scribe. He's not going to do that. But he does have the notion that there is a commandment that would be greater than the others that maybe would sum up all the others very succinctly. So what is that? And Jesus answers and says, he quotes the Shema out of Deuteronomy 6. It's something that a Jewish person will quote every day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your uh, soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The greatest commandment. And you will love your neighbor as yourself. And so, Jesus' answer is basically this. This is our one obligation to the one God. God is one, and you could do a whole sermon on the oneness of God, the unity of God, uh, maybe even a Trinitarian thing going on in the New Testament, right? Three in one, but Old Testament, the Shema was, he is one God. They would have understood that as he is above all the gods, all the idols, all the, all the angelic hosts and any of the demons. He's over all of them. He is one God. And so we have one obligation to him, that's love. It certainly incorporates things like reverence, worship, fear, obedience. I mean, all those things are kind of grabbed up into that, but there's a word that's given. Uh, Jesus, well, and the Greek word is agapao, which is a verb, love. We get the word agape from that, that, that sacrificial, selfless kind of love, agape. You shall love the Lord your God. And this is the one obligation. So you can take all of those commandments and you can really sum it up. And this ought to be I mean, I think it still ought to be a little shocking to us to say, I only really need to do one thing when it comes to God, and that's love. Just one thing. And I know that that one thing applies in many, many different kinds of ways. I know that means not lying. I know that means praying. I know that means worshiping. I know that means all these different kinds of things. But it's just one thing for the one God. Secondly, you might notice that the love flows out of our inner being. It starts in the heart. In fact, when you read Deuteronomy 6 in the Shema, um, the, the, the verses that the Jewish people will quote all the time, you notice that it says these commands are to be on your heart. Something about the heart and where it starts, that your heart would love God fully, and then it begins to flow out of your inner being into all the other places in your life. Your soul, which is sometimes your will, your, your will to do, um, your, your mind, which is your intellect, and then your strength, which is your hands, what you're doing. And then it's all flowing through there. Love starts here. Remember, Jesus says, when you get yourself in trouble, you just because something started in your heart, some evil thing that was in your heart eventually gets out into your hands and you do that thing. But it always starts here. And it's an all-consuming sort of thing that starts in your heart. Listen, you would, um, I, I, I like, always loved fractions when I was in school, working with fractions, multiplying fractions, dividing fractions. Sometimes I, I, when my kids were younger, I'd help them with their homework and we would do the fraction thing, you know. Um, but we're not about fractions here when it comes to God. That's not what we're called to. You would never send a card to your spouse and say, I love you with half my heart, at least. 80%, baby, it's all yours, 80%. The last 20, it's, it's me, you know. You would never get away with that. You, if you send a card like that, you would die by paper cut. I am sure, I am sure that's how it would happen. There's nothing romantic in saying 25% of me is all yours. And yet that is exactly 
how in practice we end up doing things with God. We say, I'm going to give you some of me, but there's some places that I'm not going to let you speak into, some places that I'm not going to change, some places that are not yours. Christians don't do fractions. It's 100%. It's all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind. It all belongs to him. There's no part that's mine. I'm obligated completely to him. That love flows from the inner being and eventually it makes it on the hands. You can fake it for a while, but a love that's grown cold eventually will make your hands cold too. It eventually makes your mind think about things you shouldn't be thinking about, but it always starts in the heart. Where's your desire for God these days? Where's your heart for him these days? What's going on in there? Because if that's not turned towards him, we've got problems And the scribe says, you got it right. The scribe says, you answered well. The scribe takes a position of authority in Jesus' life and says, essentially, verse 32, you're right, teacher. You've truly said he's one. There's no other besides him. And to love him with all your heart, with all understanding, with all strength, to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So, You got it right, Jesus. Good job. Well, he's God. And so he steps back towards the scribe with authority and says to the scribe, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're close. You're really close. You see the authority that Jesus takes in the scribe's life there? I see that you agree with me and that's doing really good and you're almost there. Now, think about this with me for a second. Um, Have you ever been in a position of praising a political, a person from the opposing party that you never vote for. You know, maybe you didn't vote for Trump, but you said something good about him. Maybe you didn't vote for Biden, but you said something good about him. And the people around you were like, (gasps) you know, I mean, in the divided age that we live in, unfortunately, it does seem rather shocking if you would say something good about the person on the other party. But maybe they did something good. Maybe you liked what they did and you said something good about them and people gasped around you. Why would you say something good? And so the scribe, I mean, I'm thinking about this. The Herodians don't like him. The Pharisees don't like him. The Sadducees don't like him. The scribe says, that's right. And he stepped out there and he got really, really, really close to the kingdom. You're right there. But agreeing with Jesus' teaching is not getting you in. Saying Jesus is a good teacher doesn't get you in. It's faith, right? And so you might ask, well, what gets you in? What what, what makes you cross the line to get into the kingdom of God? Well, look what Jesus does next. And we'll see exactly what that means. Verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And a great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching he said, beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. They will receive a greater condemnation. So, these are the experts. They are the scribes. They, they're the know-it-alls. They know what they're doing. They know what they're saying. But Jesus says they've got a Bible problem. They've got a Psalm 110 problem. If you keep your finger in Mark and look at Psalm 110 briefly, Psalm 110, I learned this week that Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, which kind of makes sense because Hebrews 7, I think I said 6 in the first service, it starts in 6, but Hebrews 7 is like a, a commentary on Psalm 110. You owe it to yourself to read Hebrews 7 after hearing a sermon like this. Um, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Here's the problem in Psalm 110. The scribes would say that David's going to have an heir, a descendant. And that descendant's going to be the Messiah, the Christ. 
like we're in on the secret here. We know it's Jesus, but, but go with me. The scribes say there's a Messiah coming and he's going to come through the line of King David. And David says, the Lord Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So this Messiah is going to be called, David is calling him Lord. Now, I've never called my kids Lord. I've never called my kids Master. I've never called my kids Your Honor. If anything, they should be calling me that. Right? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> um, you, you would never go that direction where the older one says to the younger one, you are Lord. If anything, it would be the younger one saying, the Lord, saying Lord to the parent. You, you're the one in charge. You're my dad. You're my mom. I honor you as the child to the father. So why in the world would David call the future Messiah, the great, 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 great grandkid, Lord? You don't do that. That is not appropriate unless it is appropriate because it is the Lord and so Jesus says, they've got a Messiah problem because David calls the Messiah the Lord and he's the son of David. Um, and then, it, uh, I know, I wanted to like do all Psalm 110 because there's like so much here. But, but let's do this, verse four. Verse four, here's a big verse. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So check this out. There's, um, a Melchizedek was... Uh, um, um, guy in the Old Testament, priest in Genesis. He's hanging out with Abraham. It's a mysterious kind of meeting. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I understand the whole thing perfectly, but Melchizedek is a priest. He's a priest that predates Moses and Aaron and the Levitical priests that come up in Genesis, uh, Exodus, number, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It predates the Levitical priesthood. You got a priest before the priests. One guy, Melchizedek. And, and God says that this Messiah, this Lord, is going to be a priest forever. And God is swearing to it. You know how you get sworn into the military, you get sworn in as a judge, you get sworn in as a president. Um, God doesn't swear in his priests. I mean, if you look at the Old Testament, you look at Leviticus, they're not swearing in. Now, there were ceremonies that when Aaron became a priest, but God doesn't swear them in for life. Eventually, they're going to die. And when they die, their priesthood ends. Uh, if you want to know more about that, read Hebrews 7, because the author of Hebrews makes that really cool point. Like, priests aren't priests forever, and yet here, God swears. He does something he doesn't do with Aaron. He takes an oath and says, this priest that's coming is going to be a priest forever, which implies, which implies that they will live forever as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Um, so if you're a scribe, you have to be willing to admit, you have to humble yourself and be willing to admit that your priesthood your sacrificial system is less than Melchizedek and this Messiah that's coming. That's why Jesus said to the first scribe, you are so close to the kingdom because the scribe said that love was greater than the whole sacrificial system. You can sacrifice bulls and goats and it's, a, it, 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 it's bloody and it's death and it covers sin and all that, but to love, that's where it's at. And the scribe said, that's right. And he was so close. But he wasn't there. Um, back to Mark. You would have to humble yourself if you were a scribe and admit, sorry, we're in part two now here, clearly. Um, <laughs> part two. You would have to humble yourself if you were a scribe and admit that the Messiah was going to be Lord. And here's the problem. Pride denies the lordship of Christ. The great, if the great commandment is love, the great sin is pride. I feel like I've said things like this before, but you've certainly noticed that pride is the safe sin to admit when you're in a group of people. 
because it makes you actually look kind of good. It's kind of like saying, you know, you're, you're doing a job interview and give me one of your weaknesses. I just care too much. You know, I just work too hard sometimes. I put too many hours in. You know, <laughs> oh, I see you're a good worker. That wasn't a weakness, you know. Like a real weakness. Tell me what you're really like. Um, I, I sin. I struggle with pride. Do you know there's a, a website out there that, that talks about the shoes that pastors wear, preachers wear? And there's some preachers out there wearing $5,000 shoes on a Sunday morning. Oh, right? Pride. Um, pride denies the lordship of Christ. Pride says, there can't be anybody above me. Pride exalts the self. I mean, someone ought to say sometime, I struggle with, with, with the sin of pride, and there'd be a gasp. <gasps> you know, you exalt yourself above God? You don't love your neighbor because you think you're better than your neighbor? You are a wicked person. You ought to be in a small group sometime and say, I struggle with pride. And someone says, repent, lest you perish, because it's so wicked. C.S. Lewis would say, the other sins are like flea bites in comparison to pride. It's a huge sin that leads to all sorts of destructive things in your life. Pride exalting yourself, thinking you are so great. That's not love. Love is selfless. Um, so, here we go. Jesus says, here's the things the scribes do that are so prideful. And he has a list. They walk around in robes. They love greetings. They take the best seats. They devour widows' houses, and they pray long prayers. Let me put those up for you on the screen. Do you struggle with pride? What about what you wear? I find it funny, you know, I grew up, you wear your best to church. Did you grow up like that? Well, the scribes wore their best to church and Jesus denounced them for it. I feel justified right now. Um, I'm gonna come in shorts next Sunday. I just know it. Um, maybe not, maybe I won't. You know, uh, clothing, the way clothing works now, you can get nice clothes at a good price. You know, you, you, you can go shopping for the sales and get a good deal, right? But do you dress to excess? Do you dress in a way that says, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at what my clothes say about me. Do you see what I'm wearing? They were wearing their Calvin Klein robes, uh, robes I am sure, you know, back then. Um, and they were wearing their Calvin Klein robes in the temple, a place where you should be humble. And yet they were saying, look at me. I was going to say, don't dress to impress, but I think dress to excess is more likely. In fact, I could probably change the word dress to drive, couldn't I? Don't drive to excess. What do you come to church in? What does that say about you? What is the outward appearance? What are you going after when God just wants your heart. It's not wrong to dress up nicely. It's not wrong to have a nice shirt on and, and, and your slacks cost $50. That's okay. It's okay to wear a suit that costs $500. It's okay. But what does it say about your heart? What's going on there? That's the pride problem. Secondly, there's esteem. Uh, they liked uh, being greeted in the marketplace, Jesus says. It's not wrong to come to church and want people to greet you, to say hello to you, but it could be a problem if you want people to recognize how great you are. You're a scribe? Oh, yeah. You're somebody. And if we go around and, well, I'm not going to talk to them, but I hope they talk to me because they would recognize me for who I am. I entered the room, you know? But I'm not going to greet them. I want to be greeted by them. That could be a problem. Do you seek special attention? Why did people not notice what I was doing? Didn't they see how I served there? Why do I never get recognized in church? Don't those people get recognized in church? Special attention. And then they take the best seats. Again, I don't know if there's best seats. No one wants to sit in the front row, apparently. <laughs> Maybe the back row. Is that the best seat in the house? I'm getting a thumbs up there. Oh, you prideful people. <laughs> oh, when the pastor calls you out. Sorry, sorry. Um, 
I think the second row is the best seats in the house, personally. I, I really do. Um, not too close, but not far away. Um, do, do you go to weddings and wonder why you weren't seated in a better spot? I, I, I heard of a family once. This is legit. I mean, a family that, that did not, they were family members of the bride and groom, but they didn't get really good seats, and they were angry about it, and they expressed it. It happens. Do you think you deserve the best spot? Could be an issue. I know I'm talking about first century stuff that we would never think about, but um, fakeness. How about this one? They pray long prayers. Jesus prayed long prayers. He prayed all night. Nothing wrong with long prayers unless you do it to be heard by people. Do you know how to act when you come to church? Do you have a switch that flips and you act like your spiritual self when you walk into church? It's almost refreshing, I, I will say. It, it's w- in a weird way. It can be refreshing for someone to be just so blunt and honest and you're like, wow, do you know that you're in a church saying that? But, but people are just saying, this is, this is who I am. This is what I struggle with. This is just how it is. And like, oh, God bless you. Because God sees the fakeness. He hears the long prayers. He hears the, the religious speak. And he can see right through it. I think some of the best prayers I've heard in my life have been when I'm sitting, talking to somebody, maybe in a counseling appointment, maybe premarital counseling, and I'll ask the person to pray based on what we've talked about today. I usually follow because I think prayer is a ministry that I, that I want to do for people. I want to intercede for them. But sometimes I ask the person themselves to pray. And they have a fumbling, bumbling prayer that's so genuine, so authentic, and they just say, man, I've messed up, and they just pour it out there, and I'm like, man, God loves that. He loves that. I mean, you can pray all night, and he loves that too, by the way, but the fakeness that God sees through it. I have a hard time but seeing through it, but God does. He sees it. And then you get to, um, so pride, pride's the great, love is the great commandment, pride's the great sin, and now we get the great example. Here's your il- sermon illustration today, and it's a widow. Verse 41, he sat down opposite the treasury, watched the people putting money in the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came, put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than the, all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all, all, all that she had to live on. Um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And she puts in all she has. Sometimes I watch sports commentators and they will talk about the greatest of all time athletes, otherwise known as the goat or the goats. There's a football goat, basketball goat, who we all know to be Michael Jordan. And uh, there's a lot of goats for different sports. Who is the goat of discipleship? You could make a case it's this widow and it's not the person you expect. It's not the flashy person. It's not the person saying, follow me, everybody. It's not pastor so-and-so. It's a widow, goat, greatest of all time disciple. This has a special place in my heart, this, this passage, this last part. Uh, I had a first sermon in church, but I also had a first sermon that I ever preached in my entire life in Bible school, and it was this passage I thought, what does a college student have to say about a widow, you know? What do I know about that? First thing I ever preached, the widow. Greatest of all time. I also, of course, I know that the ultimate example of love is Jesus on the cross, but I think the widow, um, her humility is only noticed by Jesus. Do, do you see that Jesus sits opposite the treasury he's sitting down and he's watching he always does that you know Um, and he's seeing people put money in the offering box commentators will say that these are probably trumpet shaped offering receptacles trumpet shaped 
And so when you put the money in it, it, it made a noise. If you're rich, it made a big noise. If you're the widow, it was like, and nobody notices her. Nobody looks at her except Jesus. And that's true with the humble. Nobody knows what you're doing. Only you and God know what you're doing. You ever served somebody and you were like, man, I wish someone would have noticed that? You ruined it. You ever served somebody and you're like, when do I get a little recognition in church? You ruined it. Now, there's nothing wrong with being recognized for service, just so you know. I mean, after all, does not Jesus point out the widow's offering? He's pointing it out. There's nothing wrong with us saying, to somebody, well done. You've served really well in this area. That's great. It, that, that's good. And I love doing that. But her humility is noticed by Jesus. And humble people do a lot of things that nobody sees. And they're not desired to be pointed out. But Jesus sees it. Another thing that I'll point out, and I think I've already done it. I've already made a big deal about the word all here. She gives all she had. If God doesn't come through for her, she goes home and she dies. She gave it all. And the rich people, they give a percentage. They give a fraction. Oh, we're good with fractions. Christians don't do fractions. We do all. We do 100%. That's us. And her humility, her, her love, her great love is revealed by giving it all. Now, one time I was sitting in a group of pastors we were talking about the widow, the goat. And uh, one of the pastors said something that I've never ever forgotten. He said, remember in the passage right before this one, Jesus says that the scribes devour widows' houses. So he said, when you preach the widow, you're supposed to preach it like she's being exploited. She's being taken advantage of. I think that in my estimation, that there's something to that. I think the scribes were taking advantage of that widow. Shouldn't she be the one being taken care of through the temple treasury? Shouldn't the scribes be saying, who's going to help that woman? I, I think there's something to that. Good observation. But... Is this not an example of an exploited, taken advantage of, beaten down person? A person whose house might have already been devoured by the scribes, who maybe has nowhere to go next? Isn't it an example of her triumph? The greatness of her love? Isn't it a reminder to all of you that, that, that no matter what has happened to you at the hands of somebody else, that there's triumph in front of you when you love people well, that you overcome that, and that Jesus sees it and he notes it and he says the scribes are going to be condemned because they devoured and she gave. And that will never be forgotten by God. Do you see? Do you see? There's something great about the one that's been taken advantage of and has given all and loved and served and maybe that's how you ought to start seeing your own service the way that Jesus sees it. I hope today that you heard something. I, I hope today that when you hear the word all, that something comes into your mind. All of you, what does it mean? Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for the gift of your son who sacrificed himself. He was a priest forever and yet he was the priestly sacrifice. That's mind-blowing. I'm sure they never saw that coming. The priest that climbs onto the altar. The priest forever. Jesus, we love you. And so may we love you with all of ourselves. And I, and, and I know for every person, I think they ought to hear that a little bit differently. What does the all mean? For the widow, it's the last 
to coins that barely equal a penny. Father, would you lead us and show us what that means? What does all mean? And Lord, for us, may it not mean a fraction. In Jesus' name, amen.